Hi, I'm Norm Roblod, founder of the Digestive Health Institute and creator of the Fast Track Diet. Today's topic is SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and how to address it effectively to prevent recurrence. SIBO is a complex topic and research is ongoing for improving both diagnostics and treatment. But let's talk about what we know so far. What is SIBO? Back in 1949, a researcher named Fraser described SIBO as fecal bacteria colonizing the small intestine and competing with the host for essential nutrients and perhaps winning. He was an expert on nutritional malabsorption and his description is still relevant today. SIBO is a form of dysbiosis involving an overgrowth of our native gut microbiota as opposed to an invading pathogen. Culture studies have identified several different bacterial species, some, negative, some native to the small intestine and some migrating from the large bowel into the small intestine. And there's a wide variety of these strains. They include strep, E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Staph, Micrococcus, Lactobacillus, Bacteroides, Clostridia, Villanella, Fusobacterium, and Peptostreptococcus. New research is trying to determine the most prominent bacterial strains in SIBO. For instance, the Pimental Lab reported that E. coli, Aeromonas, and Klebsiella species predominant, are predominant. On the other hand, a group of genomics researchers, Sephori and colleagues, suggested that it's actually a loss of diversity in the small intestine that's more important for symptoms than SIBO itself. Now, one limitation of that study, potentially skewing their findings, for SIBO is that they included patients with other diagnoses such as celiac disease, colitis, pancreatic insufficiency, and even patients that underwent GI surgery. Regardless, the current prevailing view is that SIBO sufferers have too many bacteria where they don't belong. And these bacteria produce proteases, enzymes, gases, and other end products, causing symptoms but also damaging the mucosal surface and villi. This damage can impact the ability to digest and absorb nutrients, minerals, and vitamins. The result is poor digestion, which shunts nutrients to overgrowing bacteria, causing a vicious cycle of damage, malabsorption, and overgrowth, in the words of Elaine Gottschall. SIBO is linked to many digestive disorders and also health issues, including IBS, GERD, obesity, esophagitis, Crohn's, diverticulitis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cirrhosis, diabetes, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, asthma, rosacea, restless leg syndrome, interstitial cystitis, cystic fibrosis, Parkinson's disease and heart disease, and also autoimmune conditions including celiac, Hashimoto's, and scleroderma, as well as type 1 diabetes. And this list continues to grow. The exact number of SIBO sufferers is unknown, but it's likely well over 100 million people in the US alone, given the number of conditions linked to SIBO. So what are the symptoms of SIBO? SIBO symptoms include gas, bloating, distension, flatulence, abdominal pain, cramps, acid reflux, diarrhea, nausea, dehydration, fatigue, brain fog, and skin conditions. Constipation is another common symptom that often occurs in concert with intestinal methanogen overgrowth, or IMO, most notably involving the organism. It's an archaea, Methanobrevibacter smithii. More severe symptoms of SIBO may include weight loss, failure to thrive in children, steatorrhea, which is fat malabsorption, anemia, bleeding or bruising, night blindness, bone pain, and fractures as well as leaky gut and autoimmune reactions. These symptoms are not a complete surprise because SIBO occurs in the small intestine. The mucosal surface in the small intestine is sensitive to damage that not only impacts digestion but also impacts its barrier function. Leaky gut allows undigested food particles, bacterial antigens, and toxins to enter systemic circulation. Leaky gut, coupled with something called molecular mimicry, is considered a hallmark of autoimmunity. Now, how to diagnose SIBO? There are really only two methods at this time. One is breath testing, and the other is actually culturing bacteria from the small intestine, which is considered the gold standard. 
But neither test is truly a gold standard. Each method has drawbacks and limitations. Eventually, better methods for sampling the small intestine, coupled with advanced genomic testing of the bacterial populations present, will prove superior. But we're not there yet. So right now, non-invasive breath testing is the most common way of diagnosing SIBO. Breath testing is based on the idea that excess bacteria in the small intestine can ferment sugars and other carbohydrates and produce unique gases. These include hydrogen, which can be further metabolized into hydrogen sulfide and methane in the case of sulfate-reducing bacteria and archaea organisms, respectively. These gases diffuse into the bloodstream and they're exhaled through the lungs. You know these gases are coming from your gut microbes because other than tiny amounts of hydrogen sulfide, none of these gases is produced by humans. There's two types of breath testing that are routinely used for SIBO. One uses the sugar lactulose, it's non-digestible but fermentable. The other uses glucose, another fermentable type of sugar. I recommend lactulose breath testing even though it's less specific for SIBO with more false positives. It's more sensitive at detecting SIBO throughout the length of the small intestine. The problem with glucose is that it's rapidly absorbed in the early part of the small intestine, so it can't detect SIBO in the lower part of the small intestine very well. Most breath tests measure two gases, hydrogen and methane. Hydrogen is linked mostly to diarrhea, while methane tends, uh, that's produced by these archaea tends to be linked with constipation. The newest breath test called TRIOSMOT measures three gases, hydrogen, methane, and also hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is a gas produced by sulfate-reducing bacteria, and there's a wide variety of these, disulfovibrio, disulfobacter, and disulfobulbus, but also bilophila, Pseudomonas, Citrobacter, Aeromonas, and several others. At normal levels, hydrogen sulfide is actually a beneficial anti-inflammatory gasotransmitter or signaling molecule contributing to physiological health. But excessive amounts have been linked to diarrhea and possibly constipation, genotoxicity, inflammation, and also um, altered mucosal integrity. Challenges with breath testing still remain. For example, rapid transit, how quickly food, in this case sugar, moves through your small intestine may give false positives. For instance, if the lactulose sugar moves too quickly through the small intestine, it ends up measuring colonic fermentation instead of SIBO. Also, there's a question about the ability of breath testing to accurately diagnose SIBO when there's very few bacteria present. As little as 10 to the 3, that's 1,000 bacteria per mil, is technically positive for SIBO. But can such a small number of bacteria produce measurable amounts of these gases in the breath test? Also keep in mind that SIBO is only one of several forms of dysbiosis. Being SIBO negative does not necessarily exclude the possibility of other forms of dysbiosis, including small intestinal fungal overgrowth, CIFO, intestinal methanogen overgrowth, IMO, or even large intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or LIBO, as well as significant imbalances in individual strains in your gut could be the cause of your symptoms. Additional tests to consider with SIBO include a comprehensive blood test, comprehensive stool tests, and in some cases, endoscopy and colonoscopy. Okay, what are the treatment options for SIBO? Unfortunately, the most common treatment is antibiotics, a class of drugs that I researched and developed when I was in pharma. The top two antibiotics for SIBO are rifaximin, approved for IBSD, a SIBO-related condition, mostly to address hydrogen-producing bacteria, and then a combination of rifaximin with neomycin for constipation to address both SIBO and the intestinal methanogen overgrowth. It's reasonable to think that SIBO is an infection and therefore something that needs to be killed. Antibiotic treatment is based on this notion, but we should keep in mind that SIBO arises primarily from bacteria in our own large and small intestine. These bacteria are part of our commensal population. 
They play an important role in nutrition, immunity, bile acid levels, appetite regulation, fat storage, and protection from true pathogens. So keeping them contained, in balance, in the right place, instead of killing them, seems like the best strategy. Also, we don't want to kill off indigenous small intestinal bile tolerant bacteria that have an important role in digestion and health. Now, antibiotics can be useful when your symptoms are severe. For instance, if you become malnourished, experience significant weight loss, or have other serious symptoms or SIBO related health issues. Antibiotics won't work in all cases, but they'll often reduce the overgrowth improve symptoms, and help restore small bowel function. Unfortunately, antibiotics do not address the underlying causes. And without that, SIBO or IMO or other forms of dysbiosis uh, will likely come back. So with or without antibiotics, the underlying cause piece must be part of the overall treatment strategy. Another challenge with antibiotics is that they're not as effective as you might think. Many intestinal bacteria are resistant or tolerant to antibiotics. Regarding rifaximin, a 2016 study showed that 64% of SIBO-related IBSD patients relapsed and required a second treatment. And retreatment was only 6.6% more effective than placebo. Now, at least rifaximin is one of the safer antibiotics because it stays mostly in the intestine, minimizing systemic reactions. And the same is true for neomycin. Moving to more powerful and systemic antibiotics increases the risk of side effects, including Clostridia difficile infection, allergic reactions, and bacterial resistance, which renders, renders antibiotics less effective for fighting serious infections in the future. How about herbal antimicrobials? Many herbal extracts are known to possess antimicrobial activity, based on testing in the lab or the test tube. But this activity has not been confirmed in well-controlled human trials. Also, individual herbal extracts tend to be less potent than synthetic antibiotics, and that's why they're often used in combination, including things like allicin, berberine, oregano oil, and neal in combinations. While a variety of these extracts have been proposed for SIBO treatments, there's not much published literature on the efficacy. A small study in 2014 found that a combination of herbal antibiotics was at least as effective as rifaximin, but we need more definitive studies to confirm these results. And also keep in mind that rifaximin was only 10% better than placebo in the study used to get FDA approval. Now what about probiotics? You may have heard that SIBO patients should not take probiotics because why would you add more bacteria when you already have an overgrowth. Well, probiotics are not a panacea. Some may be helpful based on some studies. Here's a few that come to mind. In a 2016 study, a combination of bifidobacterium bifidum, lactobacillus acidophilus, and streptococcus in GI cancer patients with SIBO showed that SIBO was resolved in 81% of the treatment group compared to 25% in the placebo group. A 2014 study uh, looking at a probiotic containing a combination of bifidobacterium and lactobacillus strains along with streptomophilus resolved SIBO in 24% of liver disease patients in the treatment group, but none in the control group. A 2020 study of Saccharomyces boulardii with the antibiotic metronidazole given alone or together to systemic sclerosis patients for two months showed that Espelade resolved SIBO in 33% of the patients compared to metronidazole, which resolved SIBO in 25% of the patients. Together, the results were additive, in other words, over 50%, which might suggest that each works by a different mechanism. A 2009 uh, report on 40 SIBO patients with diarrhea and other symptoms uh, that were given Bacillus clausii for one month uh, they reported a 47% SIBO eradication rate. Keep in mind, this was a letter to the editor, not a full-blown publication, so the details were a little limited. A study on 20 patients with constipation 
right, IMO intestinal methanogen overgrowth, showed that lactobacillus ruteri given for four weeks significantly improved weekly bowel movements and reduced methane levels. Now, while probiotics can be helpful, some people may experience symptoms such as loose stools, bloating, abdominal pain, particularly when they first start taking them. Let's talk about other dietary supplements. A variety of dietary supplements are promoted for treating SIBO, and some of them can be quite helpful. Here's some examples. A multivitamin with minerals to address, address nutritional deficiencies, digestive enzymes with or without bile salts to improve digestion. And by the way, improved digestion limits the fuel for SIBO. Uh, betaine HCL and sublingual B12 if you suspect you have low stomach acid. Also see my video on are you at risk for low stomach, goes through, low stomach acid goes through the risk factors. Um, and of course you always want to get to the bottom of why do I have low stomach acid in the first place and address the cause. Uh, L-glutamine, zinc carnosine, and N-acetylcysteine. These are some of the supplements that have been uh, proposed for mucosal lining support, integrity, and potentially um, for antibiofilms. Uh, Antibiofilm agents are mostly enzymes and they're effective at disrupting biofilms in the laboratory, but there's limited data to show that they work in patients. It's true that most of our microbes, in fact, most microbes on the planet exist in biofilms, but most of these are healthy biofilms. So disrupting biofilms in the gut is at the very least a little bit questionable. I can see these for invasive biofilms, like what you get in wounds and or what is seen in uh, colon cancer. Um, but on the mucosal surface, we have this mucus that can be sloughed off to take care of biofilms on its own. So it's a question of whether we need um, additional um, help there or not. There's five things to keep in mind when taking supplements. One, make sure that you're not taking toxic levels of certain vitamins or minerals. For instance, A, D, E, B6, zinc, iron, and calcium are some that can be toxic. Consider that some supplements can impact other medications you might be taking. And three, make sure they don't contain excess fermentable carbohydrates, which can further fuel SIBO. Most supplements are meant to be taken for weeks to a couple of months. Long-term use may carry health risks because there's no studies that will show what happens after taking them a long time. Number five, read up on all possible health risks and, uh, and side effects before taking them. Look at the labels carefully. Again, supplements can be quite helpful when used judiciously, but over-supplementation is common, and unfortunately, it can complicate things in treating SIBO. So I'm very careful when evaluating and recommending specific supplements to my clients as part of my consultation program. Finally, let's talk about diet. Last but not least, your diet and dietary behaviors are two of the most important factors along with identifying and addressing underlying causes. The pervasive view on diets for SIBO is that SIBO diets only address the symptoms, but the symptoms are not just floating out there in space. They're being caused by something. A few years ago, I gave a talk at SIBOCon and it was focused on this exact point. For more information, you can watch that presentation on this uh, channel. My conclusion was that diets that limit specific carbs or overall carbohydrates are effective at resolving symptoms, but they also reduce intestinal gases, short chain fatty acids, they restore pH balance, and they address dysbioses in SIBO related conditions, including IBS, obesity, and epilepsy. And views on science-based diets are changing. For instance, 91% of 1,500 gastroenterologists believe that diets are as good or better as medical therapies for IBS. This was based on a survey conducted in 2018. In the past, many of the symptoms we now associate with SIBO were recognized as carbohydrate intolerance. Sound familiar? This is an important point because carbohydrate intolerance is a form of malabsorption that can lead to dysbiosis and help feed SIBO. For instance, lactose intolerance. It's very common in SIBO patients and it's been recognized for over a century. While fructose intolerance, which is also linked to SIBO, was first documented in the 70s. 
recently sugar alcohols, except for erythritol, as I've talked about before, and dietary fiber intolerances have been added to the list. And I make a case in the Fast Track Digestion books that resistant starch is related to dietary fiber and should also be limited for SIBO and other conditions involving carbohydrate intolerance. According to the Merck Manual, the standard treatment for carbohydrate intolerance is to limit the offending species of carbohydrate. This simple conclusion is supported by the textbook of primary and acute care medicine, which states that dietary alterations that, to reduce intestinal gas, a hallmark of SIBO, require the reduction of lactose, fructose, certain oligosaccharides, resistant starch, fiber, and sugar alcohols. This is precisely the group of carbohydrates that the fast track diet limits. The very same recommendations for IBS are also found in the Nice European guidelines, and these are based on Cochrane reviews and other published literature. Mike Sweeney, a dietitian in the UK, and his colleagues used the fast track diet for their IBS patients and reported its effectiveness in his service evaluation. And you can see a link to the, uh, the transcript video of this evaluation. Uh, there's also a pilot study, it's still in the preprint stage, dem demonstrating the effectiveness of the carnivore diet in resolving SIBO. And finally, the elemental diet, which eliminates all complex carbs, is quite effective at addressing SIBO. Now, regardless of whether you take synthetic antibiotics or antimicrobial herb herbs, a diet that limits fermentable carbohydrates is required for addressing SIBO. And once your symptoms are fully resolved, then you can experiment with reintroducing certain carbohydrate species slowly and safely as your digestion improves. To pull this all together, all four elements I talked about can play a role in addressing SIBO. For serious cases of SIBO with nutritional deficiencies, antibiotics may be recommended and appropriate. But for fully addressing SIBO and preventing recurrence, there's three key elements that can't be ignored. One, do everything you can to identify and address the underlying cause or causes, which will vary from person to person. And there is a total of at least 25 or 30 possible underlying causes. On this topic, a chapter in the Fast Track Digestion books will be helpful. Some examples include pancreatic insufficiency, antibiotics, bile acid issues, right, too much or too little, or excessive bile deconjugation by certain bacteria, poor, uh, resulting in poor reabsorption of the bile acids, uh, brush border enzyme deficiencies, uh, villi damage, uh, low stomach acid, and anything that alters motility, including GI infections, medications, excessive methane levels, scleroderma, surgery, adhesions, diabetes, etc. Number two, limit fermentable carbohydrates in your diet, particularly lactose, fructose, resistant starch, fibers, and sugar alcohols. You want to match your diet with your ability to digest and absorb the nutrients, particularly carbohydrates. SIBO bacteria depend on carbohydrates as their primary fuel source, either directly or as downstream byproducts of fermentation. For instance, the methanogens, the sulfate-reducing bacteria, use hydrogen produced from the primary fermenters. Number three. Incorporate pro-digestion, pro-absorption behaviors and practices. This area is often overlooked, but plays a critical role in addressing SIBO and other forms of dysbiosis. How are you selecting your foods? And how are you preparing them? How are you storing them? And importantly, how are you consuming them? Do you leave spaces between your meals? Do you eat slowly and chew well? Do you have a fast? And what's your approach to breaking fast? What dietary supplements have you tried aimed at improving digestion? Each of these three elements are features of the Fast Track Diet. For more information about the diet system, you can read the Fast Track Digestion IBS book. There's also one on heartburn. Or you can use the Fast Track Diet mobile app for implementing the diet. For questions and support, you can join the Fast Track Diet Facebook group. And for individual consultation, you can contact me through digestivehealthinstitute.org. 
Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please share and subscribe and I'll see you next time.